Along the coast of New England, all the way to Hudson Bay, the coals of war have been stoked to flame and fire on the frontier. Welcome to Blood and Pigment. I'm Dan. I'm Guy. Fire on the Frontier is a new expansion of Blood and Plunder and No Peace Beyond the Line. This new book expands on two important late 17th century conflicts, King Philip's War and King William's War. And today, we have an exclusive interview with one of the writers of this book. Let's let him introduce himself and tell us who he is. Hi, I'm Joseph Forster, and I'm, thank you for having me on your show. Wow. Thank you so much for sitting down for this interview. I know you're really busy. Uh, right. Now, what can you tell us about Fire on the Frontier? <laughs> 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 All right, so I guess we can. Uh, this is one of the worst kept secrets. I've been working on some stuff for uh, Firelock Games, and uh, a while back they had me start working on this Fire on the Frontier expansion of an expansion, <laughs> zeroing in on a couple late seventeenth century conflicts in New England. Yeah, we we got that from the uh, the release, but why are these uh, two wars notable to us war gamers? I've really enjoyed uh, reading up on them. They're remarkable in a couple of ways. They're kind of the first American wars in New England. The natives and the uh, English settlers got along reasonably well for a long time. Uh, they, I think they, Plymouth 1620 is when it was founded. And then like Massasoit uh, worked with the settlers for his entire life. It wasn't all roses but it was pretty good pretty integrated and then by 1670s things had got pretty sour uh misunderstandings and nastiness on both sides and then eventually boiled over and this is the first real oh there's other fights before him but this is the real first open conflict in this area between natives and uh, English, and it was very complex. Um, so we have the Europeans learning the native fighting style, eventually adopting it during this era. We have complex relationships between natives and English, and natives and French, and natives and natives, and uh, it's just a lot of different uh, things coming to a head and patterns that would be set that would go that would uh, follow through for the next 100, 200 years. It's also something that I noted is that the type of conflicts that are or in uh, King Philip's War, most of the conflicts that happened were raids and small skirmishes. It wasn't like later wars where they had hundreds of people on a battlefield. Yeah, a lot of the uh, little skir uh, battles are small. There's a couple that have uh, more than a thousand on each side. So Ooh. there's some there's some big battles, but a lot of it is surprise attacks, one side trying to catch the other unprepared. That's the tactic that the natives preferred uh, for a long time, and that's what they liked best. If they there was no sense in doing a stand up fight, equal foes, you want to catch, you want to have the advantage, overwhelm, and be done, and not lose a bunch of your men. Oh, that's uh that's something I didn't expect, and that's kind of. Those type of uh, smaller conflicts are what Blood and Plunder is great for, when you each side only has 20, 25 models. Yeah, there are some skirmishes that you can represent accurately with the numbers. It's kind of fun. Really exciting for wargaming. Yeah. Now, as a, a follow-up to that question, uh, are there any other historical wargames that you know of that cover the same period? I wish I was... Better person to ask about that. I haven't played a whole lot of historical war games, to be honest. Um, but doing research, I didn't bump into anything. I can say that. I think most uh, black powder war games focus on French and Indian War or Revolutionary War. It seems to be, or English Civil War, but not um, as many 17th century America conflicts. Or even early 18th. Cool. So this is a a period of time in conflicts that there isn't really a lot of competition to represent on the tabletop. Yeah, I think so. And as far as I can tell, there's not a lot of awareness about these two wars either. It's kind of a lot of Americans think 
history started in 1776. <laughs> <laughs> but there was a, this is a hundred years before that. <laughs> so I'm going to ask, because, you know, I 2% take contention with this. Why is this coming out instead of Raise the Black? Where are my pirates? Raise the Black is coming out. Just not yet. <laughs> not being a representative of Firelock officially, I can't tell you but, um, exactly, but Raise the Black is in production. All the development's been pretty much done, but they're just working with Chinese, and that sometimes takes a while. So that's been, it's in the works. It's supposed to come out last month, and it's going to be a few months yet. This is a project we had talked about, thrown around for a good while, and uh, it was kind of birthed as a update to the native factions from No Peace Beyond the Line. No Peace Beyond the Line, the natives kind of focused on the Caribbean or South America, Central America. The model line really supported that. The North American factions felt not complete. Got a little rushed. Yeah. And there was no models for them. So they got the Braves out last year. Got some models to represent the North American factions. So we they wanted to flesh out the North Americans a little more. Because they did fight different. And they look a lot different than the Central South American Caribbean natives. So that's where this started. And if you're going to do new, new native factions for North America, you might as well update and tweak the English and French and the first time that these forces really fought in a major way were the, these two conflicts. So kind of spun off from there and put some flesh on it and it's a nice little book now. All right. Where are the Dutch? We don't need Dutch. Nobody likes the Dutch. That's what I hear. I was about to ask that, you miserable cur. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the Dutch got their asses kicked out of New York, so what can I say? But there is a Dutchman. There is a Dutch commander who's English now. His parents were Dutch from New York, Peter Schuler. Uh, he has a Dutch spelling of his name. He's quite a good commander, so you'll want to pick up that North American um, kind of the raiding party from New York. Peter Schuler, he's motivated and has some good rules and he can take some Dutch soldiers and the, North America, the uh, privateers, New England privateers can take a lot of Dutch sailors as well. So there's yeah, You got to have the best, right? If you're going to sea, you better take the best. <laughs> you can <laughs> now get hard chargers on your interplogue. How do you like that? I need to buy this book. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> Hang on. I'm going to go buy this book real quick. We'll pre-order it pre-ordered the book. Now that I know I can get enter plug with hard chargers, I'm sold. That's all I needed to hear. <laughs> yeah, but once the Dutch got kind of kicked out of New York, their only representatives are down on the Caribbean, I believe, or maybe further south. That's fair. That's where most of the money was, right? So that makes that checks out for them. Yeah. yeah. I did notice that the uh, some Dutch units do appear as support units in the, the preview that we've seen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's still a lot of Dutchmen in New York, um, and they just turned, transitioned into the English colony, so they would have been present a lot. Now, uh, while Dan is ordering the book, if I could get you to elaborate on something that you touched on, uh, what is in this book? What does our money get when we buy this book? It's kind of a just compact but full fledged expansion. It, but it only it covers. Uh, it doesn't cover the whole New World, so it covers, uh, like you said, King Philip's War, which was mainly English and uh, New England area natives, and then King uh, William's War, which is a larger conflict, almost a, a and it involves the French heavily. So there's going to be a chapter on natives. Several new factions, several updated factions, a bunch of commanders, and a character or two. Then be a chapter on English. Same thing. We got some new factions, some updated factions, and a bunch of new commanders and a couple spicy characters. And then French. And since they're overpowered and everything else, we tried to make them the worst possible. And this 
actually not. They're still overpowered. <laughs> That's canon. That checks out. <laughs> but we tried to not let them run away. Um, French to rep- uh, and they were heavily involved in King William's War and their alliance with the natives. So three, only three nations rather than six. And then we got new legendaries. Actually, they aren't new legendaries. They're some of the important characters from these conflicts. And actually, there's three of them. And they're all in No Peace Beyond the Line, but they're getting their own models now. And they're getting Ooh. their own legendary factions with new special fancy rules. Ooh, who are they? What are yeah, these? So that been noted? Uh, the three promotions are King Philip. It's kind of funny because he... <laughs> Not necessarily the most dynamic or successful leader, but Metacomet is his Indian name. King Philip is his assumed English name. Um, he led the uh, conflict against the English 17, or 1675, 76. And he gets his own kind of native raiding faction. They attacked a lot of uh, New England towns and villages. And then we got Benjamin Church, who is kind of uh, directly fighting against him, he was one of the first to really pick up some of the nat- uh, native tactics and fight successfully against the Indians using them. So his uh, native, his uh, rangers. And then Iberville for the f- French. He is a giant of a man. And nice. he, yeah, he's active from King William's War through Queen Anne's War. So he gets his own. And he did so many things. He was an explorer and a trader and a general and a raider and a yeah. He did. Yeah, I think he gets the prize for the most factions he can lead. Oh yeah, yeah. He gets to lead French expeditionary force, French Royal Navy, French Canadian privateers, French Canadian militia, and now <laughs> all of the legendaries that you talked about get their own factions. Yep, and his faction kind of it's kind of fun how it layers in a bunch of those different. Uh, focuses all in one so he's a very flexible commander and a very flexible faction should be fun oh that's exciting well what else is in this book okay then we got the faction got the legendaries and then this is my favorite part we got a whole chapter on fortifications Ooh. we have blood and pigment of uh it's been one of our things we are able to publish a non-official uh fortification supplement to help make that uh, palisade fort usable. And now those uh, rules have been polished and codified into the real rule uh, selection. Plus we get several more fortification. Um, We get some new fortified houses. The block house is coming out. We get a a New England, kind of a unique New England style fortification, the garrison house big, heavily built wooden structure that everybody would run to during Indian raids and just try to hunker down and Ooh. defend until reinforcements could come. It's really fun. We got the Palisade Fort, obviously. There's quite a bit of fort action going on in these two conflicts, especially, and the Indians had them too, so that should be fun. Mm-hmm. You must be very proud. Your baby's made it into the book. Oh, I know. It's been so many years coming. <laughs> Yeah, it's really exciting there. Should be a lot of kind of new ways to play with these fortifications. Been playtesting quite a bit. It's been fun. So in addition to the new models, are they going to release the uh, Palisade Bastions? They are. They won't come out. I think they're going to come out in January. That's the tentative uh, word. There was a bunch of, they ordered a bunch more resin, but then it got delayed. So they're just waiting on a resin shipment. Those um, bastions take a big, a good chunk of resin. Those are heavy guys. Yeah, the Palisade Fort will get bastions, so you can make them a little more interesting, dynamic. You can put cannons in your Palisade Forts, clear the land around, killing zone, and load up your grape shot and have a good time. So what about that last portion of the book? I hear it's pretty juicy. Well, the uh, fortification is hard to get better than that. But the uh, uh, last part of the book is some scenarios. And uh, kind of a new direction with the scenarios. And this links to something I should have mentioned at the beginning. At the beginning of the book, instead of just being a timeline, there's a pretty well fleshed out historical narrative that outlines um, 
really well written. I'm really impressed. I didn't do it. <laughs> um, uh, narrative through the two wars. And then at the end of the book, we have some scenarios, some historical scenarios. So rather than being competitive, generic scenarios, we're going to get at least four historic scenarios that directly relate to an actual skirmisher battle from the wars. So you get suggested uh, forced lists, you get suggest, uh, per, a little more strict setup instructions, and then you can kind of play through these battles. And they aren't all necessarily 100% 50-50 balanced because of the way those conflicts really played out. So kind of more narrative scenarios, pretty fun. So four of those at least, two from King Philip's, two from King William's War, kind of feature some of the main commanders and feature some of the new pieces of the this book, the fortifications and whatnot. And then a couple generic scenarios that kind of represent the more common styles of engagement during the wars. And yeah, that's that's it. That sounds like the most the most new scenarios we will have in a book. I mean, the beginner, the Blood and Plunder book had what five, and then No Peace Beyond the Line added five more. And now we're getting it sounds like around ten. That's a lot of scenarios. Well, they're a little different because the original, the first two books have five times three. They have five, and then they're all available to all three setups: land, amphibious, and sea. There's going to be at least six in this book, but they're all very narrowly focused on one theater. So the raid, the Sudbury fight can only be fought on land, unless you can figure out how to float your village in the water. <laughs> Don't tempt me. <laughs> so yeah, no, not as many as it sounds like, but there'll be at least six scenarios, but there are not three versions of each one. If that sounds awesome. I got one more question for you that I'm sure everybody's chomping the bit to ask. What's the new model line going to look like? How's it going to differ from the old stuff? Yeah, it's just expanding on it. It uses a lot of the same units, but we get a few new ones. Uh, main and already released or pre-ordered, uh, avail available pre pre-order models are the natives. We got the Braves a good while back, and they're available and metal right now. And then we got Young Braves that you can order, and they are primarily armed with bows, but they're more of a North American, more of an Iroquois style of uh, dress and hair and accessories and whatnot. And then we got the Nyases, kind of more elite. They're more like advisors, spiritual leaders of uh, the chief. They're your elite native unit, seven point, good stats. And yeah, so, um, so two new sets of four models each for the natives, and they're going to be produced in a different medium metal is getting prohibitively expensive so these are going to be more of a resin high quality resin i've talked to some guys who've been doing some painting on them sounds like they're really slick really no compromise in quality compared to the metals so really looking forward to getting my hands on some of those looks like we're going to be getting them early next month i believe oh, and then wow. we got a commander for the natives woodland native commander same style of uh, Iroquois pointy finger commander guy with a musket. And then we got some legendaries. We got uh, Benjamin Church and King Philip all ready to pre-order. Deberville will be coming, but he is not available for pre-order yet. But he's been promised that last legendary commander. And then there might be, there's two new units, a new unit each for the French and the English. and those should be sculpted early 2022 and available as well. But focus is on the natives right now. Okay. okay, so I have a hobby question for you, which is, you know, kind of out of, usually out of my neck of the woods, but I have lots of people who ask me. Um, so this resin, a lot of us have had bad experience with resin models, primarily Citadel Finecast. <clears throat> is this going to be better than that? Yes, I've got some Citadel Lord of the Rings stuff that is atrocious. It's all bent and curvy and mushy yeah. and it's flat on one side. And... No, it will be better than that. Like I said, there's from what I've seen and from the first-hand experience of some guys that have, uh, have been painting them for the promo models, there's no real compromise between this new resin 
and the metal, but the resin can be cheaper, which is nice. I like the metal. I love metal. I wish we never had to leave it. But if it's a choice between paying 50 bucks per set of four models for metal and paying 15 for resin, I'm happy to go resin. Resin, I, I enjoy as well because it's easy to change and modify and uh, kit bash. Uh, metal is a lot harder to do those things. And it is. It's way harder to glue metal. I hate, I hate yeah. glue metal. Me too. It's terrible. Apparently they're durable, but I'm almost afraid of plastic or resin breaking and having to... I'm glad they've been kind of stuck with metal being so expensive. They haven't released any new models for a long time, so I'm just really glad that there is another option that will get them over a roadblock. I believe they know how to do it. They're doing the... The ships are, are mana resin, so it's not like they're like new at this. Yeah, <laughs> it's not like they've never poured, they've done they've never done a resin pour before. They do them, I'm sure. There's a lot of ways to work with resin, so this is actually more like three D printed resin, I believe, rather than a poured, yeah, uh, cast resin. But they look real slick. The pictures went up on the Facebook page today, and they look great. They look good. They look good, and even. As terrible as um, Games Workshop is for their their fun cast, uh, after a while they did get a little bit better at it. But yeah. they're anything. There are there are companies out there that do good resin. Yeah, yeah. In my mind when I hear resin, it went to fine cast. I think I was talking with you, Joe. It went to fine cast, and it went to like the Reaper Mini resin, where it's just I don't know if it's resin, but it's a white plasticky type material that just looks terrible. So when mm -hmm. I heard resin, I went, "Oh no!" But you've sealed those fears away. Everybody has strong opinions on what gets used for the miniatures, but I think Firelock is committed to producing high quality product. So hopefully, it'll all be great. Yeah, my 150 plus miniatures all say that it's high quality. <laughs> Now to to drill down in something that you mentioned a little bit ago, um, the Native Americans in No Peace Beyond Line have a fun and unique playstyle with them, but it does have a really high skill ceiling where you just get murdered on the table if you really if you don't understand what you're trying to do. Does this <laughs> book do anything to change that? Short answer: No. I think natives, since the the game was designed kind of around European tactics. And then they have to give more special rules to natives to make them different. They have weaknesses, and then they have all these other special rules as well. So I would say the natives are much more complex than your Spanish militia. Um, if you, yeah, and if you try to play them like Spanish militia, you will get killed. <laughs> Um, so yeah, they are an acquired taste. They take some practice, but I think they're potentially quite good too. They might even be a little more complex in some ways than the natives in No Peace Beyond the Line. We have a couple factions, like there's so many different tribes or nations throughout this region and time period, but most of them are pretty small, but they all played important roles. So it's nice to represent that and honor that but you can't make 45 native factions so we have some native factions and then we have some force options like you have new england tribes and then you have force options for the mohegans and the uh wampanoag and the narragansett so you got it's kind of crazy you got your native main uh nash nation rules so you can't take cans you can't take big ships all that gotta remember that and then yep. you've got your faction rules that gives their whole group of flavor. Then you've got your force option rules. You've got your specific tribe you're representing. it. Then you might have some commander rules that tweak that too. So, yeah, there's quite a bit going on. But it makes them uh, unique and flavorful. And it honors the history too. So another thing I was going to ask is it's a... The more we advance in time, we realize a lot of our opinions of Native Americas that we received are really quite negative. How does this 
uh, work respect the Native American culture? Yeah, I've learned a lot just doing all the research and study for this. It's a very complex situation, and we learn it from the English perspective. If you have a, and we read those firsthand accounts, you have a naked man screaming, coming at you with a hatchet and splitting open your kids' skulls. That makes an impression. And that has flavored our writing of history. <laughs> but yeah, we look at the other, you look at the other side of it, the big picture as we do more and better history and research. Uh, there's reasons that they objected to English in their uh, homeland. So tried to write the biographies and the faction summaries showing both sides of it. It's kind of just kind of sad, actually, reading how the relationship between the English and the Indians in this era, it was quite, it was probably the most integrated situation in North America where they got along pretty well. But uh, as the colonists became more self-sufficient, they just didn't need the Indians as much, so they just failed to treat them as equals, lost respect. If they don't need them, they're just kind of in the way, and they kept pushing them out and treating them more and more poorly. Uh, resentment builds up with the natives. The English see themselves as superior. The Indians try to see themselves as equal equal nation under the same king but yeah it's just a lot of resentment builds up until it boils over they just can't take it anymore so i hope the writing i think there's a, a bit more writing in this book than in you know peace beyond the line fleshing out some of the history zeroing in on a smaller uh theater lets you do that a little bit so hopefully yeah. it gives a balanced uh, view and explains some of how these things came to be. I also do like, I just checked, uh, you added 11 new named Native American commanders. Yeah, as we get a little further in hit, uh, down the timeline, there's a little more record, especially in this era, because a lot of these uh, guys spoke English and they were pretty, like I said, well integrated. There's a lot of record of um, who these guys were and speeches they gave and so yeah we have a lot more information so we're able to represent some of these characters in a better way although there's one faction here we, we updated from no peace beyond the line the westo kind of this mysterious tribe that came out of the north into the southeast virginia south carolina and we can't find one named person the english especially south they didn't really keep track they just use the natives, and then if they got in the way, eh, killed them <laughs> or pushed them out. Um, but yeah, there's one faction we could not find a named. You know what for, you should but... do then? You should add a character or a commander called the Unnamed King. <laughs> unnamed Westo King, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> unnamed is good in Blood and Thunder. Unnamed African. <laughs> well, that's the the problem with history is. Uh, it's we all know it's written by the victor, and they a lot of the time they were, were concerned with recording their own names and deeds, but not the perspective of those they conquered or the names of the dead. And in this case, the losers didn't record things in a written way, so we just don't have some of that. But yeah, like what you say is true. The English especially were bad about it. There's a ton, way more records of the French, the Indians, in, at least in casual or uh, reading, a lot more records of the Indians who were working with the French than the English. New England was pretty integrated, the first colonies there, but then as it went on, the French actually were integrating more into Indian culture and becoming part of it rather than forcing the natives to become like Europeans. Mm -hmm. So some fun French uh, native uh, crossover. Some French can command native tr uh, factions and some natives can com command French factions. So that's an interesting dynamic in this book too. Yeah, that's exciting too. 
from a French player perspective. Uh, I like it when all my models can work with each other. Yeah. <laughs> Gives me that dream of having that that one large game where I just field everything on the table at the same time. <laughs> 200 models. With ship support. <laughs> <laughs> There's one big ship scenario in this game, too. Oh, there is. The Tell us a little bit about that. Battle of Hudson's Bay. It's one of the furthest north uh, battles in North America. You had two pretty big ships go head to head two uh, English and a French, probably fourth rate. Uh, Iberville was up there. And then there was three English ships, one, uh, two, one big one and then two smaller ones. And they just hammer and tongs, broadsides, just blew each other to pieces, basically. And oh, the wow. French prevailed with one ship versus three. But with yeah, Iberville on it, though, too. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, so... That's a pretty big naval scenario. The official lists call for two sixth rates, so you better buy those for get Peyton right now. But there's also free play suggestions as far as uh, trying to build balance lists. You can use two of any kind of comparable ship and kind of outfit them. It has a couple instructions there. But yeah, the English ship just was battered. Pieces have been in the Caribbean before, so it probably had some rot in the wood, and eventually it just sunk in a matter of minutes after a particularly hefty broadside. It might have hit a shoal, maybe, or it might have just foundered and really water started to come in. It just went down. Everybody on board. They hit a hidden shoal. <laughs> maybe there's kind of several different uh, accounts of it, and um, Liam Liam Taylor, he is the other. Uh, main developer here, and he's in a lot of the writing and research. He spent a couple days just trying to figure out how the ship sunk, and he consulted with vendors and literally found a first-hand... I'm spoiling all the fun stuff for the Tales of the Sales guys. But, yeah, some fun history, digging into the little details. Um, how fun. It's fun. We'll have Are to, we uh, sure that ship's captain wasn't also named Joseph? <laughs> <laughs> Had to get that dig in there. <laughs> No, that sounds uh, that sounds exciting. That there's a a big naval conflict scenario that's in this book as well. In addition to being some land scenarios, I know there are are certain blood and plunder players who only like playing sea games. Those narrow minded players, yes. Yeah, they're. I almost call, call them more like oak and iron people because all they do is is yeah. sea games. If you bring Glenn's feud into my house, it's going to negatively affect our relationship, guy. <laughs> but speaking to that, yeah, there's going to be a, a update for the French Canadian privateer faction and a brand new and very interesting uh, New England privateer faction. So there will be some nice factions with some new stuff going on for people who really like to play at sea. Yeah, yeah. And there will be an opportunity for natives to take larger ships. Ooh. Ooh. If I could get my uh if I could get my Westo on a on a Corvette, that would be some great boarding opportunities. <laughs> nope. Uh, the, ah, darn. Some of the tribes in Maine, the Wabanaki Confederacy, they stole quite a few uh, smaller ships, but maybe sloop or brigantine size. Um, and they had their own little fleet. They weren't particularly maybe great at it, and they didn't really use cannons much, but they did have a fleet of reasonable sized ships at some point. Oh, how cool. I heard Guy automatically thinking, how can I get natives onto my turtle galleon? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you can do that already with the uh, French Canadian privateers. They have Indians as core, so you can go crazy. Don't tell yeah. him. <laughs> I want to save on save on two. <laughs> That's all I want. <laughs> you can do it. <laughs> so the whole book should be about eighty pages, but packed with new content. Some of it's updated from new piece be on the line to kind of zero in on this these couple conflicts but a lot of it is new and fresh content focusing on a couple 
uh, fresh play, t play styles and got this whole section of new fortification stuff with some scenarios to emphasize that. It should be a lot of uh, interesting stuff to keep us busy while we wait for Raise the Black to actually get to us. Yeah, and I'm really looking forward to it. Well, thank you, Joseph, so much for coming on our exclusive interview to talk about this. I know you, you're you busy Very and honest. you're not really – you're really doing things that, uh, that are not uh, YouTube-related these days. <laughs> Good to be on my own show. <laughs> As a guest. <laughs> As a guest this I didn't time. Have to I didn't have to prepare. You guys got to uh... – um, make all and ask all the questions. It was great. <laughs> yeah, and and leave this. I just want to thank Firelock Games for letting me work on this project. It's been a lot of fun, and I hope players enjoy it. Well, for more Blood and Plunder articles, you can go over to bloodandpigment.com and check out all the articles there. We have articles on ships, nations, factions, terrain building, painting guides, and battle reports. Go check it out. Check out the rest of our YouTube channel as well. We'll be aiming to put out a video every Monday. Subscribe and ring the ship's bell so you can stay notified of our uploads. And as always, keep your dice ready and the wind at your back, yarhar.